It drives all these chronic diseases. So we now have the toxic metabolite. We know why sugar is doing this. We know why sugar is bad for you. We know why sugar is toxic. That is detrimental, unrelated to its calories. And we know why everyone's getting sick. And we know what to do about it too. And I'm very comfortable with this. Welcome to the Fat Emperor Podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. I'm here in the Royal College of General Practitioners and I have a very special guest today who I'm honored and uh, privileged to finally meet with Dr. Robert Lustig. Welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Ivor. Oh, not at all. Early in my research journey, way back, I found pretty early on your bitter truth. It's now at 8 million views. So I'm told. Yeah, I checked last night and it was incredible. I was enthralled because it actually appealed to a mass audience, which is highly unusual for such a complex lecture. For someone like me who has biochemical background, it was I watched it several times in a row, and I'll have to admit, I used your slides in my talks with engineers and without getting permission, but... Right. It's called the academic binge watch. <laughs> oh, big time. Yeah, big time. Yeah, I have no idea why anyone would watch a 90-minute uh, uh, lecture on carbohydrate biochemistry. So the fact that anyone watched it uh, was surprising to me. Never mind 8.2 million. I mean, that's just crazy. It's crazy, but it's crazy good. The, the, thing, the passion actually was part of it, because most lectures in biochemistry are obviously dry as sawdust. Uh, the passion was enormous, the conviction. That was a big part, I think, that well, drove it. The thing, the thing mm. is, look, I'm a practicing physician mm. and a scientist, and you know, for every one patient I took care of and got better, 10 more would show up in my door. There was no way I was ever going to fix this. And the thing that really, really bothered me was I learned virtually everything I know about nutrition in college because I majored in nutrition and food science at MIT. And then I went to medical school and they beat it out of me and told me that everything I had learned was irrelevant, it had no place in patient care, and it wasn't necessary, and that really all I had to do was focus on calories. I figured, well, these are the clinicians, you know, I'm... I'm going to be clinician I better like listen to them and so I practiced that way for like 20 years and then I started doing research because my patients weren't getting better and I started doing research to try to figure out what's going on and it like all came rushing back to me kind of like post-traumatic stress disorder it's like oh my god I knew this stuff back in 1975 so I got pissed off so I think part of the passion actually is sort of the the being dumbfounded and the anger of what I see going on in medicine today. So I'm glad it translates in a positive way and that people uh, appreciate the passion, but I'm just like really ticked off. Yeah, and rightly so. And uh, I know when I originally discovered in my own small way that my blood tests were way out of whack and three doctors in succession couldn't give me any convincing feedback, um, when I actually discovered how it essentially worked. Uh, I was really angry too, because I thought of all the hundreds of millions of people who are suffering, whatever about me, and no one seems to know how it works, even at a basic level, which is mm -hmm. crazy. Indeed. Yeah. So. so one thing that occurs to me, and a couple of people have, have wondered it too, so I'll ask it, uh, that original video and the Fat Chance was the, the book essentially around that. Uh, years later now, is there anything in there that you would change which are further research or, or possibly emphasize in different relative ways, do you think? Well, we have more data. So there, I mean, if I rewrote it today, there'd be so much more that I could add, you know, in terms of fuel to the fire. Uh, there's nothing in the book that's wrong. So there's nothing I would retract um, I would add certain things. And I've also recognized that the uh, role of fiber, you know, and there's a whole chapter on fiber, so it's not like uh, I discounted it. But I've come to realize just how important the fiber story really is. Ultimately, I can sum up healthy eating in two clauses. Protect the liver, feed the gut. 
Protect yeah. the liver, feed the gut. If you protect the liver so that it's not getting the tsunami of mono and disaccharides that come from ultra processed food digestion and absorption early on in the duodenum, then you protect the liver. If you can move that food through the intestine so that it doesn't get absorbed in the duodenum and gets further down to the jejunum so that the intestinal microbiome can chew it up. That means even though you ate it, you didn't get it. Since this is a macronutrient excess problem, this chronic metabolic disease problem, if you can get your bacteria to chew it up instead of you, then it doesn't really matter what passed here, it matters what passed here. Right? It doesn't matter what you ate, it matters what you absorbed. So if you feed the gut, you solve the problem. Protect the liver, feed the gut. Real food does that. Processed food doesn't. Yeah, no, I love the way you summarized that. And also, of course, when the bacteria take these foods that do pass down to the lower intestine, you know, they will make beneficial things. They make short-chain fatty acids even more to the point, and because those are anti-inflammatory and anti-insulin. They suppress insulin. So, yeah, short-chain fatty acids have turned out to be an enormous help in terms of understanding the role of the microbiome. There was just an article uh, in, I forget, I think it was Nature, uh, on the role of short-chain fatty acids and where they come from and how they work. And basically, you got to get the food down there in order to be able to get those bacteria to do it. And they actually use soluble fiber as their substrate for turning into short-chain fatty acids. So again, I think there are a whole host of reasons why real food works. And there's a whole host of reasons why processed food doesn't. And that is the crux of the problem. And the question is, how are we going to fix that? Especially when the food industry doesn't want to fix it. Yeah, that is a killer. Now, I actually ended up on RTE, uh, Ireland's primetime television, in a debate last year with a professor of nutrition and who actually works with the ILSI, the International Life Sciences Institute, and has published multiple papers uh, essentially attacking and undermining the Nova European body who are trying to simply categorize ultra-processed foods so there is some guidance. Very aware. So um, there's a paper will be coming out shortly about um, in the UK looking at uh, the various swaths of the Nova classification. So going from non-processed all the way up to ultra-processed. And basically 56% of the calories and 62% of the sugar in the UK diet is in that ultra-processed food category. That is the goal. That is the target. That is the problem. That ultra-processed food category. And the question is, what do you do about it? Because that's where the money gets made. And it's even worse than that because if you take those ultra-processed foods, only 19% of the dollars you pay for pays for the food. 40% pays for the marketing. And the last of the 40%, that's their profit. Well, I actually didn't really have any of those figures now. I would have guessed it, not a mile off that because I know it's insane, but it's great to hear those figures actually quoted. Shocking, really. And you're absolutely right, Robert. Well, you're obviously right. But it, the thing about the processed food industry, they need shelf life. They need to scale enormously across the world. Uh, and they need dirt cheap ingredients and refined carbs, grains, seed oils, doesn't come any cheaper. It doesn't come any cheaper, uh, and and also the shelf it also life. Doesn't, it also doesn't come any more dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, circling back to what you were saying about the duodenum and that, I had lecture or interviews recently with uh, Gabor Doshi, who's an extraordinary individual in Hungary who does deep research. But he exposed me to all of the GIP in the upper intestine mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. overexciting of that yeah. versus proper foods that go down the intestine and excite GLP-1 and right. PYY gives satiety and all the right. benefits. So maybe talk and a little. Also, I mean, they, they increase insulin release, but they go to the brain and reduce total food uh, intake. So yes, I mean, GLP-1 agonists are now being used for diabetes and showing some uh, effects on weight loss. Uh, it is, they're now, you know, primary uh, uh, modes of therapy for type 2 diabetes in the United States. My point is, yes, that's great and wonderful, except we could be doing that so much cheaper, so much easier, and so much across the board. 
And even though these GLP-1 agonists exist, they're breaking the bank. So this is not a sustainable method for dealing with the problem. Ultimately, we cannot treat our way out of this problem. We have to prevent our way out of this problem. It's the only way to be able to recoup medical resources that are being thrown at this, that's breaking the healthcare bank and the budgets of every developed and developing country around the world. There are no options. When you look at the six cellular pathways within the cell that are uh, associated with longevity, they are also the same six cellular pathways of chronic disease. They are glycation, oxidative stress, inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, insulin resistance, and membrane instability. When you look at the actual metabolic pathways of each of those, none of them are druggable, except maybe inflammation, and that's actually downstream of the others. They're all foodable, but not druggable. And they're only foodable with real food. In fact, Processed food is what actually causes those dysfunctions. So when we treat various diseases like GLP-1 analogs for diabetes or any hypertensives for high blood pressure or oral hypoglycemic agents for you know, high, uh, hyperglycemia or uh, statins for LDLs, basically what we're doing is we're treating symptoms of a disease, not the disease itself. And so if you treat a symptom and you haven't actually fixed the disease, guess what? The disease is still there. And that's essentially getting worse. Yeah. And if you take fructose then, which is a major problem in processed food and not in real foods nearly so much, obviously, um, and you take refined carbohydrate or essentially glucose, fast flash glucose that'll hit the GIP one. Um, how would you see those in terms of deleter deleterious potential? So a lot of fructose or a lot of refined glucose or is it really the mixture together with one pushing up insulin and the other acting through ATP in the liver? And right. Well, the, in fact, you've got it exactly right. Um, they both are problematic. It's not that one is safe and the other one's not. They're problematic in different ways. So glucose is the energy of life. Every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. Glucose is so important that if you don't consume it, your body makes it. So people on ketogenic diets still have a serum glucose level. The Inuit, they didn't have any carbohydrate. They didn't have any place to grow a carbohydrate. They had whale blubber, okay? They also didn't get cancer or heart disease, all right? Um, the fact of the matter is they still had a serum glucose level. This was proven back in 1928 that they still had a serum glucose level. So where'd the glucose come from? Well, they're, it's so important that their livers turned fat or protein into glucose so that their bodies could and would function. So it's not that glucose in and of itself per se is problematic. It's the insulin response to glucose that is problematic because insulin, while lowering blood glucose, also causes cell proliferation, causes vascular smooth muscle proliferation, causes cancer cell promotion. It causes insulin, so glucose causes insulin secretion. And it's the insulin secretion that drives these chronic metabolic diseases and also drives weight gain. So it's not like glucose is off the hook, <clears throat> but glucose is a walk in the park compared to fructose. So fructose does not generate an insulin response unless you so overwhelm the liver that you get a serum fructose level, in which case then that fructose circulates, goes to the beta cells of the pancreas, and you do get an insulin response because there is a fructose receptor in the beta cell, which only kicks in when your liver gets overwhelmed. And then you've really got a fructose rise. But mostly what happens is the fructose goes to the liver, overwhelms the liver's capacity to metabolize it, turns the excess into liver fat through this process called de novo lipogenesis that we've studied. And that liver fat accumulation causes liver dysfunction and insulin resistance. So glucose causes insulin secretion, fructose causes insulin resistance. They both end up with high insulin levels, but for different reasons, and ultimately have different implications for chronic metabolic disease. So they're both important.
Mm. And especially, I suppose, synergistically together, overloading both together is, is the worst case. And that's most processed foods absolutely. have an element of that. And sucrose itself, of course, is the straight 50-50 of uh, both. Absolutely. Yeah, and high fructose probably. corn syrup is even worse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, it's around 65 or something fructose. Well, it can or, be. It can be up to 65% fructose, yeah, yeah. depending on uh, which uh, uh, distributor and which uh, mm. food maker. Yeah. yeah. Well, you actually mentioned insulin and or hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, obviously a favorite topic of mine. Dr. Joseph Kraft, who died last year, who did the 15,000 insulin assays, mm -hmm. his quote, one of them I loved was, uh, hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, they are not combatants, they are one and the same. Mm -hmm. And what he really meant Indeed. is for pathological states, they're two sides of a coin. But on that thorny question, well, for some people who are nerds, is it more the hyperinsulin uh, begetting the insulin resistance with time or insulin resistance building which can happen through other for other reasons driving hyperinsulinemia or is it kind of both yes. together yes yes <laughs> yes it's, it's both it's both <laughs> it can go either way mm. so insulin resistance at the level of the liver can cause hyperinsulinemia and chronic disease or Insulin secretion at the level of the pancreas can drive weight gain, which will then lead to insulin resistance too. In other words, if you have a, a circle of insulin, insulin resistance, and weight gain, it can go in either direction. And different people go in different directions. And to be honest with you, for, in terms of treatment, you actually have to be able to parse that. You have to be able to figure out where the origin of the problem is in order to direct your therapy to that target in order to get beneficial effects. If you enter the pathway at some other node, it won't work. And this is why it's so essential to n understand, you know, nutritional biochemistry completely and also see each patient individually and know their physiology in order to be able to target the therapy to the pathology, which is what we did in our obesity clinic every day for 17 years that I ran it. Excellent, yeah, Rob. And I, I often say to people when I'm trying to explain, the arrow of cause can, can go in multiple directions depending on the scenario. And exactly, if you don't, for an individual case, if you don't find out where you are in it, you know, you're not going to be effective. But the, the great thing is that real food works for virtually everybody. Yes. Now, there are outliers. There are people where real food is not going to be the answer. They have maybe genetic defects or, or epigenetic abnormalities or potentially developmental programming issues where something even more uh, extreme may be required, including, you know, shall we say, altered or multimodal dietary uh, therapies and or drugs. And, and we used them as we needed to. But if you're looking for a general public health message that will help virtually, I would say, 90 to 95% of the population right off the bat, it's real food. Yes, and I, myself and Dr. Gerber, we say three eliminations, sugar, refined carbon, seed oils, and then processed food is... That is processed food. That is processed food. So I say processed food is stuffed with all three, is what I always say. And, and that's, that's it. If food. people only did that... Yes, there will be people who have diabetic dysfunction who can benefit from low carbon keto, you know, give or weight loss. Yeah. And all that's true. But for the vast majority, just that switch away from processed food would have an enormous bang for the buck. Exactly. So I think there are people who require um, a, shall we say, very low carb or even sometimes ketogenic diet in order to suppress their insulin so severely that uh, it's, that becomes necessary in order to turn them around metabolically. And I have taken care of patients in clinic who had insulin responses to an oral glucose tolerance test that were in the hundreds, even thousands. An, a serum insulin at 30 minutes of 900 and then at 60 minutes of 1300. Enormous insulin responses to glucose. We take those patients, we put them on a very low carb or even in some cases ketogenic diet and the process reverses and the parents kiss my feet wow that's so rewarding to be able to take such entrenched cases that the vast majority if we're honest about it robert the vast majority of of doctors and medics and even specialists endocrinologists do do not really have a full grasp of what you're saying right unfortunately they still think it's about calories or glucose, blood glucose. Well, so they, and I will tell you that we have a problem 
and you just mentioned it, um, we have this thing called sugar. And sugar really is, has two definitions. There's blood sugar and there's dietary sugar, and they are not the same. Blood sugar is blood glucose. Dietary sugar is glucose fructose. We treat them like they are the same thing. They are not. We also do the same thing for another word, fat. We have body fat and we have dietary fat, and they are not the same. And within dietary fat, we have a whole host of different things, like for instance, saturated fat. And saturated fat's not one thing, it's two. It's red meat saturated fat, and it's also dairy saturated fat. And they're not the same. And then of course, we have a whole host of other fats, like omega-3s, monounsaturates, polyunsaturates, medium chain triglycerides, omega-6s, and of course, the ever ubiquitous and ever demonized trans fat. So the fact of the matter is, um, Fat is not fat, sugar is not sugar, a calorie is not a calorie. The only way that doctors can help their patients is to understand nutritional biochemistry. Yet, it is the one thing doctors don't learn in medical school, nutrition. And it will be slow to change, in fairness. Um, well, um, we're trying to fix that. Yeah. And if we just take the fats there, and there are a myriad different fats, and they've been like stearic uh, acid is supposedly not problematic, and this other one is, and all that kind of thing, does it's does a lot of science. Well, we think palmitate is the particularly egregious compound, mm. but palmitate really does not come from your diet. It comes from de novo lipogenesis. It is the sole fat that de novo lipogenesis makes is free palmitate. We think that's the particularly egregious guy in the story. And I know Professor Volokh did some beautiful work in human studies on that, feeding very high saturated fat, low carb, and the blood fat levels of palmitate were way lower than the healthy high carb, low fat diet. Just a quick break to remind you that this podcast is only possible due to funding from David Bobbitt and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity. For middle-aged people, it is imperative to find out your heart attack risk by getting a CT scan of the heart and your CAC score. The new IHDA.ie website has all the scan resources. Please support us by visiting and sharing widely. Knowing your score, you can take action to stop the disease process and save your own life. It can even be as simple as removing sugar, refined carbs and seed oils, i.e. processed food, from your diet. And now we return to the conversation. But there's so much data now, actually. We, in a sense, uh, my own sponsor, David Bobbitt, Irish Heart Disease Awareness, he feels that what's already in the literature, there is plenty there to answer these questions. There is. More research is not really going to change much. It's yeah. a battle not based on producing more papers, per se. Well, this is, so this is a problem of science, is what level of proof do you need to act? Where is the line? And I will tell you that the food industry moves the goalposts. What they say is, <clears throat> we need randomized control trials. And then you produce the randomized controls. We need, you know, longer term. We need something else. Because they don't want to change. They're doing their absolute level best to maintain their position and their market share. So they can always say, we don't have enough research. And you know what? We'll never have enough research, but that doesn't matter. The point is, at some point, you just have to sort of bite the bullet and say, when do we have enough to act? And the answer to that is, we have way enough to act now. It's very reminiscent of the tobacco playbook, of course. It's, it's tobacco all we, over again. It's, it's exact, And I believe that the tobacco people moved into processed food. I interviewed a lady. Actually, it's really the other way around. The processed food people moved into tobacco. His name was John Hockett. He was an MIT professor. I, I hate saying that since that's my alma mater. But he actually uh, uh, worked for the sugar industry and then went to work for the tobacco industry. Okay. And there back may in have the been, 1950s. Yeah, there may have been cross-pollination then. Back the other way, I think, when tobacco got a bit squeezed, I think tobacco companies began to invest in Brussels food. Oh, absolutely. And so drinks. Altria, you yeah. know, it was Philip Morris, was, you know, Kraft, uh, you know, uh, and General Foods. Uh, uh, you know, R.J. Reynolds uh, did that, Nabisco, you know, absolutely they were diversifying their portfolio and they were bringing what they had learned in terms of tobacco to how to market uh, processed food. Snackwell's, perfect example. 
and I, I interviewed a lady, a, a fantastic lady, Joan Ifland, oh, last week in well. Seattle. I was guessing you might, and we had a lovely interview. She was fantastic talk. Lovely lady. But she, yeah, and she is this textbook, an actual textbook now, not a populist, processed food addiction. Correct. Yeah, and that sounds like one I really got to get hold of. We're actually going to be using that as a textbook at Toro University, California, where I teach. It's an osteopathic school in uh, Vallejo, California. Excellent, yeah, because she spoke highly of you, but it was briefly in the conversation amongst other things, and I didn't know how well you were connected. We are connected. No. Lovely. And if we take some, it just things pop into my head, but what pops into my head is we have the sugar and refined carb explosion and, and loss in fiber and processing in food in, in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And we've got our epidemics, diabetes, obesity, and, and all the rest. Uh, the seed oils, the soy, and not just trans fats, but the omega-6 rich seed oils, have also gone up by an enormous magnitude. And there's a lot of science around there being obesogenic. I mean, a lot of mm -hmm. animal studies and mm -hmm. very impressive ones. Mm -hmm. How do you feel those two stack up right. as so, causal? So it's very interesting. I mean, this is a complex uh, subject with a lot of data and a lot of people on either side of the argument. Um, uh, I've talked at great length about this with my colleague, Dr. Darius Mozaferian at uh, Tufts, who's probably the world's expert on this. Um, we all agree to a, to a nutrition researcher, you know, that omega-3s are good. We all agree on that. No one doubts that. The question is, are omega-6s bad? And, you know, people have talked about the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And, you know, it used to be one to one, now it's 25 to one. We also know that omega-6s are the precursors of arachidonic acid, which is, you know, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, precursor to prostaglandins involved in inflammation. And we need inflammation because we have to fight off the maggots, you know. You can't not have inflammation, you have to have it. The question is how much of it and does increased omega-6s drive it? And the answer is maybe. We don't know that. Dari thinks not. He doesn't think so. He thinks that omega-6s are not nearly as bad uh, a rap as people give them. But here's the thing that's really important. Omega-6s are in everything because they're stable, they're cheap, and they don't smell. Omega-3s smell. They smell like fish. So you don't find them in a lot of processed foods. So we use omega-6s. They don't smell. The problem is when you take an omega-6 fatty acid and you heat it, you'll supply energy to that double bond and you will basically trans it. You will turn it into a trans fat. And because so much processed food has so much omega-6s in it, and because they've been subjected to heat of various uh, methods you know, in terms of the processing, it very well could be that those omega-6s are now trans fats, and that's the reason, so that it's actually an epiphenomenon of the omega-6s being high in these foods, but it's actually the mechanism is that of trans fats. So we don't know that. So there, I think there are data implicating omega-6s in disease, but what I don't know is, is it really the omega-6 or is it what happened to the omega-6? Because food processing, food engineering matters in this case. But I expect that the food manufacturers and producers of vegetable oils should be extremely helpful uh, to help us get this answer. They, will, they would want to assist. Don't bet on it. <laughs> I know, uh, sarcasm there for sure. No, I hosted the debate between Darius and uh, Gary Taubes uh, mm -hmm. a month ago, and it was very interesting because we kind of went down a bit of a rabbit hole in that, and of course I had to bring up Sydney Hart and Minnesota and the Helsinki Businessman's Trial and all the trials where the extra non-trans generally, it's assumed, went the wrong way. Well, we don't know. But we don't know for but sure. But we don't know. I, I, I mean, I understand, but, you know, what you, what you think you know, you don't know. I think the most we know about those oils, even non-trans, is, is from animal experiments. And there's a lot of those with carcinogenesis and obesogenesis. But, but they are animals, so we don't know yet. One it's, to watch. It's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, you had a study out. One of the things since your book and, and the lecture is certain you did run a small study on children with the 
key intervention of removing fructose rather than adding in a lot of things. Maybe just run through that. Sure. So what we did, and I'm very proud of this study, and it's the gift that keeps on giving. It just, you know, nice. the data just phenomenal. What we did was we took 43 children from our obesity clinic at UCSF with metabolic syndrome, so obesity plus at least one comorbidity, Latino and African American, all high processed food consumers. And what we did was we figured out what they were eating on their home diet. We studied them on their home diet. And then for the next nine days, we catered their meals. No added sugar. We gave them fruit. That was their sugar. But no other added sugar in any of the foods that we catered. Which would be a big change for them, I'm guessing. It's Pretty. a 350 to 400 calorie reduction mm. per day. Now... We took their percent of calories as sugar from 28% to 10%. Now, if you do that, you're losing 350, 400 calories. That could cause weight loss. And so if the patients got better, people would say, well, of course I got better. They lost weight. We didn't want them to lose weight. So that meant we had to resubstitute the same number of calories we were excluding as sugar in something that was equicaloric. So we gave them processed starch. So in the vernacular, we took the pastries out, we put the bagels in. We took the sweetened yogurt out, we put the baked potato chips in. We took the chicken teriyaki out, we put the turkey hot dogs in. So we didn't give them good food, we gave them crappy food. We gave them processed food. We gave them kid food. Food kids would eat, but it was no added sugar food. Yeah. And specifically, it was not resistant starch and good starches. It was, as you not, say, not at all. The usual junk, just usual not junk, fructose. just not fructose. Mm. Glucose for fructose exchange, polymerized glucose for fructose exchange. No change in calories, no change in weight. And we then restudied them ten days later on this diet. Every aspect of their metabolic health improved. Blood glucose went down five points. Blood insulin went down 25%. Triglycerides went down 46%. ApoC3 went down 49%, which is huge. Yeah, enormous. that's big. Okay? Um, and most importantly, we've studied their fat depots. So their sub-Q fat didn't change at all because they didn't lose weight. Their visceral fat went down 7%, and that's good. Their liver fat went down 22%. And the change in the liver fat predicted the change in the insulin response. And now we've just published a fourth paper on this sub, uh, study that just came out two weeks ago in Journal of Clinical Endocrinology Metabolism, where we have actually found the toxic metabolite in the liver that fructose drives to cause the de novo lipogenesis and the insulin resistance. It is called methylglyoxal. It is an alpha dicarbonyl, which means it is 250 times more dangerous than glucose at, st at forming the Maillard reaction, the oh, glycation, the browning, yeah. the browning reaction. Mm. And every time that happens, a reactive oxygen species gets released, which has to be quenched. And if it doesn't get quenched, guess what? It drives all these chronic diseases. So we now have the toxic metabolite. We know why sugar is doing this. We know why sugar is bad for you. We know why sugar is toxic. That is detrimental, unrelated to its calories. And we know why everyone's getting sick. And we know what to do about it, too. And I'm very comfortable with this. Excellent. And I was told this morning, and I'm very conscious you have to go back shortly, but I missed your talk because I flew in from Ireland. I was late, but I was told that you had revealed that exactly what you just said. So right. we're very, excellent. we're very excited uh, because, you know, obviously people have given us a lot of flack over this notion that how can sugar be toxic? It's just empty calories. Oh, no, 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 not at all. It is metabolized differently. And one of its metabolic byproducts is toxic. And we have it. And now that you have it, you can expand the research and, and follow down the rabbit hole of, or you actually already know a lot of the rabbit holes. We, we're, we, we've already excavated the rabbit <laughs> hole. The problem is the food industry tries to keep filling it in. Yeah, and they've got a lot of shovels. They they've sure do. They've got mechanized shovels. They sure do. Excellent. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll wrap it up one moment. There was one last thing. Oh, yes, hyperinsulin's effect on appetite. 
and the mechanisms, mm -hmm. are they really well fleshed out now solidly? What's your thoughts on that? Right. So mm -hmm. insulin blocks leptin signaling. Mm -hmm. uh, that is well fleshed out. Uh, several different uh, uh, labs have demonstrated this. Marty Meyer's lab, Jens Bruning's lab, people at, the Har uh, at Harvard. Te Kevin Wis Niswender showed it back in 2001 and Mike Schwartz's lab, although Mike Schwartz still doesn't believe it. I don't know why. Um, so insulin blocks leptin signaling. So as insulin goes up, your brain doesn't see the leptin, in which case your brain thinks it's starving. Now the question is why? Why should insulin block leptin? And the answer is because there are two times in your life where you actually have to gain weight, where you want insulin not to work. Uh, not sorry, where you want leptin not to work, where you want to be leptin resistant because you have to gain weight. If you were leptin sensitive all the time, you could never gain the weight. Those two are puberty and pregnancy. Well, those are the two insulin resistant states. So doesn't it make sense that the hormone that drives the weight gain peripherally should also be the hormone that blocks the leptin signaling centrally so that those two phenomena, mm -hmm. the weight gain and the hunger, are yoked together by the same compound. So twice in your life, you want to be leptin resistant, puberty and pregnancy. The problem is we're now insulin resistant and therefore leptin resistant 24-7, 365. Winter never comes. <laughs> That's right, winter never comes. Well, listen, it was an absolute pleasure and, as I say, a privilege to finally talk to you, Robert, and I hope to meet you again soon. And thank you so My much. My pleasure. Thank you yes. for having me. Ever. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left. Otherwise, please do subscribe to the audio podcast. Thanks.